<laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I uh, I decided to give it a little a little whirl today. I'm so I'm really the My goodness. With all the YouTube. Oh, this is um Andrew. I love Andrew here. Actually, both of you inspired that like wine piece we talked about. So Andrew is great, Mr. Flores. So. That is wonderful to see. Well, Matthew, I hope you are doing well. Thank you for reading that piece the other day regarding how they like um, the system doesn't allow small communities to enter into experimentation. Therefore, they end up like they end up eating themselves. Um, I appreciated that very much. I really appreciate. Ah, Mr. Flores, there we go. Matthew is great here, Mr. Flores. Both of you do outstanding work in the con, so that's really, really great. And Matthew here just started a new YouTube channel where he's been doing some pieces on some of the concepts of the con and different things like that. And I've had some wonderful, both of you inspired that recent piece on wine and lumber and all of oh, that. Oh, nice. So that was really, really good. And um, no, we were just talking about how the other day I was, I was listening, you know, Cadell with Theory Underground had that on the big live stream where they were talking about how killing yourself on texts is yeah, like and, creating community. Right, and, yeah. That yeah, was uh, the last uh, event on day two for nice. uh, live stream. Yeah, but unfortunately, apparently YouTube doesn't, uh, after six hours or, or 12 hours or so, like they stopped recording the live stream. So a lot of the pieces, uh, like important pieces got cut off. So like we didn't save, including mine, which um, definitely, it was a shame, but it just gives me more opportunity to work through my ideas on my presentation. That's uh, on the essay that I'm working on that's going to be published through Theory Underground. So, um, you know, definitely looking forward to uh rethink and reformulate the, the thesis and ideas divine you know look at that silver lining there <laughs> I, I tell you what mr flores you are not so overly attached that you can't see this as an opportunity to negate sublated into something greater so what right. a good man that's <laughs> evil and corrupt of youtube but i'm glad you see the evil and corruption of youtube as an opportunity to perfect the presentation that is really really <laughs> wonderful you know i was i was it was interesting to me one of the things that just called my attention is how, you know, the Stoa had that conversation on wisdom cults versus wisdom comments. How do you keep a comment from becoming a cult? And a lot of like uh, Miss Ray, she was Roy, she was pointing out how it's really important for these uh, communities to have a way to test themselves. Well, mm -hmm. I actually believe that like this, the big system capitalism, whatever term we want to use, doesn't allow small communities to test themselves precisely so they become cults and thus eat themselves, right? Like that's yeah. kind of advantageous to the system. But right. then it's interesting to think how, I guess I was just comparing that with Cadell, and it's very interesting how when you're like studying the science of logic or Lacan or any of these really difficult texts, how that almost has a, like a natural way of keeping cults from formulating. Because everyone there has to admit that we have no idea what Hegel is saying here. Even right. if the guide is Cadell, like everyone is kind of equally working through it. That has a humbling sort of tendency. And so it's interesting to think how focusing on like a text like that actually can work against cult structures. Now, not necessarily, obviously, because you could, you know, that can still occur. But it was interesting to think of that. And then what were you uh, working on, Mr. Flores, at your presentation? Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, the same thing for like Theory Underground and like how uh, we're starting, like, well, Dave's starting this from scratch. So it's like, from other failed projects and the thing about like small groups uh or as Cadell and I were kind of talking about like subcultures and you see this in like uh the, like like things like uh themes in like D&G right they talk about like deterritorializing and mo molecularizing like becoming molecular like as if that's going to solve the problem it's like no you just get recoded back in or re-territorialized mm. But one thing that they don't have, and which we could see anecdotally from like my example with Dave, it's like Dave's had multiple projects that have failed. And it's like we see in, in like Hegel, Lacan, and Zizek how totalization fails, right? And so because of that, there's not going to be this complete system. And uh, I think now due to like a sort of collective cynicism and distance and even like hopefully criticism – rather than cynicism, we see that like, oh, the emperor doesn't have clothes type type deal, right? Mm. Uh, but at the, at the same time, there could be a sort of disavow that still keeps a uh, hierarchy in place or that sort of cult-like thing. But with 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 Dave and, and, and with Mikey specifically, like a lot of the times, and especially with Mikey, like people like Dave and then like other 
other people in the theory underground, like they're not like the well versed in, in 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 Zizek and Lacan compared to Mikey, and they'll even admit it. But it's like they're not going to always take Mikey's uh you know word um you know as doctor. They always take it with a grain of salt. They have questions. It's like yo, like I I don't understand what does Zizek mean by this? What does Lacan mean by this? It's like why should we take psychoanalysis seriously? Type stuff. So you know, it's really good to see the sort of feedback that creates a lot of like what we like to term hystericization. So, cause we hystericize the text, that's our philosophy, hystericize the text, hystericize the person, you know, make this uh, person, the subject supposed to know and make them really bring out, you know, the discourse. Mm. So. No, outstanding. And it makes me think of a few things. And Mr. Jockin, always a pleasure to see you, sir. Mr. Luber, it's a pleasure to see you. And we were talking a little bit about this conversation on the difference between wisdom commons, wisdom cults, and what do you do today? Because Mr. Stanley, we were talking about this kind of idea that the system actually doesn't want small communities to enter into testing so that they become a cult and thus eat themselves. And so if there's this large piss like picture, Sam, it's a delight. Oh, I had a wonderful time the other day, Miss Willem. Thank you so much for coming. And it's very interesting. Like, you know, when I'm listening to the Stoa conversation about these small communities falling into cult dynamics and eating themselves and how they need to, you know, undergo testing. And if they don't undergo testing or like um, the rubber hits the road, as Miss Roy was saying, then they can turn into cults. And, this, and so it's like, well, they need to, to test themselves. And what's interesting to me is what if the system does not allow the small communities to test themselves? So for example, if we use the Lusian language, if you deterritorize yourself, but then you are isolated, therefore you are not testing, you may just devour yourself, right? And so in Hegel, there can be an emphasis on conceptual mediation, right? Something to test yourself against so that you don't fall into this auto-cannibalism of the cult. And I was comparing that with Cadell's talk on killing yourself with text and how it's interesting when you have a community that kind of forms around like studying a text or like really trying to think something through, how that can help balance cult dynamics. And the other thing that makes me think of as well is maybe on Mr. Jockin's work on beauty, like if a community is organized around the realization of say virtues or classical virtues in terms of uh, like beauty, well that in of itself means there's something above even the teacher that makes the teacher automatically just be a guide that can work against a cult dynamic. It also makes me think a little bit of Mr. Luber's work on vertical causation, where he's, he's Mr. Luber is doing a tremendous book on storytelling and story writing that I enjoy very much. So well done to you, sir. And there's this idea that if based on Wolfgang Smith, that there's always a vertical causation that is helping things formulate, that too can never be brought down and simply translated into terms of the community. So that can help work against cult dynamics. And it's interesting to think, I think this question of how do online groups avoid cult dynamics while simultaneously not being part of the system, offering something alternative and not falling into these problematic dynamics is actually a, a really big challenge, right? What does that look like? Obviously, the Stoa is talking a lot. They were critiquing a lot of, say, Game B, Metamodern, some of the Verbeke thinking. And regardless what anyone thinks of those different groups, and then, of course, any of these online groups would have the same potential dilemma. There is this very interesting question of what mechanisms can these communities implement within themselves to make sure and to test themselves that, that they do not fall into cults if the larger capitalist system does not make it so easy for these small groups to be tested by, say, denying them an efficient pricing mechanism, denying them a way to enter into accreditation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very open question. And we can also talk about kittens because kittens are cute. My daughter likes kittens. And the more I understand kittens, the more I'll be able to pick one that she likes. So anything that you would so desire. Mr. Luber, it's a pleasure, sir. I hope you are doing well. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and thank you for the nice words. Um, I like Heidegger a lot. So I kind of find myself trapped in that thought where it's like, is Dasein, is me thinking through, th me thinking through Dasein, basically me just being part of a cult, essentially. Like, uh, th there's j this, this feeling of like, uh, I have to kind of change my mindset constantly to fit his framing, his, of, of like, his, his understanding of worldview. Um, not saying it's bad, but I, I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, every great philosopher kind of has that problem where you kind of see them in everything. Um, I think 
how to get out of that is just if the if the thinking allows for you to challenge the presuppositions that allow you to think in the first place. So as long as there's that constant dialect, and then when I say that, it's like, oh, like I haven't read Hegel really. So it's like, but once I say dialect, it's like, oh, you're in that Hegelian feedback loop. But but still, like how you understand that feedback loop uh, ultimately needs to be in a way that allows you to constantly be challenged in how you entered that feedback loop. Um, so I think that to, that for me, that's like just storytelling, essentially, just constantly trying to find ways to like correct the like the why, the necessity for why you're thinking what you're thinking and like constantly wanting to be challenged those necessities um yeah beautiful Matthew, and i'll give it to mr stanley i do think the feeling of reading a book and always being nervous that you're not interpreting it correctly is actually really healthy because that right there can help you not get sucked maybe into a cold dynamic the very experience of reading and rereading and reinvestigating that uh gautamer her hermeneutical circle problem i do increasingly wonder and feel as if there are certain habits and orientations that one gets from deep reading, which makes me think of Mr. Last presentation that speaks to this problem. But let me give it to Mr. Stanley. Mr. Stanley, Mr. Stanley is awesome. Everyone go to his channel. He's releasing a book on silence in a year. That's going to be awesome. So Mr. Stanley. Um, what's funny about the Heidegger example is like Heidegger is especially, um, he's especially open to this because you get like deep into the Heidegger word salad. But what's interesting is that, I mean, phenomenology theoretically should be able to cut against this really sharply because phenomenology is, should theoretically be something you can go back to experience and test. And so I think that where the problem is, is you get, if you get caught up in the concepts and the words that Heidegger is using, the key is to go back to what are the experiences he's trying to describe and go back to those experiences and try to artic experience them and articulate them for yourself and see where his concepts illuminate or where they obscure for you. So phenomen phenomenology is constantly going to take you back to observing your experience, trying to put it into words, trying to see how does it vary and what are the ineliminable aspects of it. And so I think that Heidegger, his thought I, does have this limiting principle because it's grounded in the ph tradition of phenomenology. That's a beautiful comment. And I always find it really interesting that when philosophers are trying to get beyond the language or get to the thing themselves, their words become more difficult. Which makes me think of the last net conversation where precisely when you want to say, I feel you, I feel seen, you're using language that suggests a failure of language because language cannot be seen. And yet at the most intimate moments, there's a signification of a certain failure in language that almost also signifies the greatest successes of language. And it is interesting how when the poets who sometimes can communicate something deeper than anyone else, poetry is hard. Like one does not read Wallace Stevens' The Snowman and go, oh, I get it. You revisit it every five years for the rest of your life. Uh, and so it's always interesting to me how these, especially deeply phenomenological thinkers, you know, Hegel would be an idea. That's a word salad. There's no doubt. And yet this word salad is one that's really good with honey mustard, that being your attention that you give to it over and over again. Or so I tell myself, and maybe I'm just trapped in the hermeneutical circle of self-denial, hard to say. But it is interesting how, but even in that very experience of the failure of language, that in of itself is a forcing function to go to phenomenology, right? Because you say, oh, I can't put this into words. Bam, let me go back. Let me look up. Let me look on, as Mr. Javier Rivera stresses at the beginning of the phenomenology of spirit with Hegel. Because basically, as we were saying the other day, the funny thing about Hegel, he's like, guys, this isn't my philosophy. This is what you see if you look up. This is just based on the world. It's not Hegelianism. This is the world, which is simultaneously an incredibly arrogant claim and simultaneously an incredibly humble claim. Because you're saying, I'm just, this isn't mine. This is the world. Isn't it funny? And so likewise, it's funny how at these extreme points, there is that kind of extremity of arrogance and humility at the same time with language as it's most intimate when it's signifying a failure in that intimacy and language that also suggests a great phenomenology also tends to fail. I always find this interesting. It's almost like we subconsciously know that to reach things, we have to do it in a manner that suggests their failure, which is curious to be. But let me give it to Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores. 
No, I really like where we're going through uh, like this whole frame of uh, failure of language, because this is like stuff that I've been revisiting, not only as like I get into um, at, like get past the uh, early seminars of Lacan, um, re uh, revisiting function and field, but um, we're revisiting uh, for they know not what they do, which is a really underrated work by Zizek that, you know, gets neglected because everybody wants to to believe that a uh, sublime object is like his work or you know a less than nothing like depending on like your uh Zizekian like uh ascension in the hierarchy <laughs> as a acolyte but and in, in, before they know not what they do it's like really his most Hegelian and like where he's like stating like why Hegel is important not only like theoretically uh understanding uh the errors and limits of the doxa of Hegel on the sort of liberal progressive side of seeing Hegel as, as synthesis or the um, deconstructive side of Derrida in which he's like, oh, Hegel doesn't go far enough because he doesn't recognize, uh, you know, that there is a deferred uh, aspect in this difference when Zizek's like, no, he's already thought of that and more. It's like the problem with it is that these doxas of Hegel only know how to count to, to to three or like it's like from zero to one you know uh one to two and then three is like the highest they ever go but they don't know how to count to four because that difference that excess also retroactively actively comes back to the prior which you'll call the vanishing meter here anyhow i'm going on a tangent the point about the incomplete com uh, the failure of language is that like as lacan says there's no meta language right that the symbolic in the way that it structures itself is already building the real within it, that, that deadlocking contradiction. And for Lacan, and it's like, maybe this is just a, a polemic that he says against Merleau-Ponty in Seminar 2, that's a little unfair to phenomenology as a whole, but that it's so caught in the imaginary because it only focuses on um, bracketing out, like, you know, what I could experience in uh, forms of understanding um etc or what phenomenology aims at it and getting back to the things themselves but what the incompleteness and failure of language does is it causes us to retroactively go back or as Zizek will call it like the mobius strip or the kleinian bottle in which yeah we go back to an imaginary state of, of experience but what the imaginary is and for all of us who know the mirror stage right well the mirror stage gives birth to the symbolic order because there is a virtual point in which the image is already an inversion, which requires a double reflection, double inversion, which needs language. You know, the image is the signification itself. So as we go back to um, our imaginary point of view from the beginning, from which we started, from which we left and we come back to, we gain new, you know, I'm going to steal a term from uh, Heidegger, a new horizon of being in which now we could start anew from the point of failure, from the, the point of failed totalization. And though we go back to an imaginary position, we continue to repeat and repeat differently. Uh, I'll never get tired of this joke. And because what causes failure, at least for Zizek using a Lacanian reading of Hegel, is the death drive, is jouissance, it's the real. And so in seminar two, he talks about insistence, Lacan does, and how the death drive is not like this destructive thing in which Klein kind of represents it as or oh, um it's it's a savvy it's 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 a thing that learns but learns too late that's what the it is it's not like this just oh animalistic bestial tendencies um that he uses the joke of the idiot boy who goes uh to a funeral after having seen the family for so long and he says many happy returns and they beat him up and say you're not supposed to say that they're yelling at him you're supposed to say may god rest his soul so two weeks later, he comes, he goes back and he goes to a wedding. And right when the, the groom is about to say, I do, he says, may God rest his soul. And then he gets beat up again. <laughs> so that is how we learn from failed language, from failed totalization, as we continue to repeat from the imaginary focal point. It's a lot, it, it makes me think, you know, Mr. Jock and I, we did work with Mr. Rivera and Michelle in the philosophy of glimpses. And one of the things we talk about is how for Derrida, you can't ever cross the divide between the signifier and the signified, right? Once you have the word cat, you can never get to the phenomenon of cat, right? There's always a gap. But what's interesting to me is, you know, that he goes on uh, on grammatology. I like to talk about, like, kind of the idea that if I have T-A-C, 
you don't really apprehend anything. You don't really apprehend anything. But then if I move the letters around, the gap appears once you hit cat, right? But what's important is that the act of apprehending cat, which is a kind of apprehension, therefore there's something there, is simultaneously the act that makes the gap appear between cat and the phenomenon of cat, right? And then you, as not grasping that circle, that hermeneutical circle that's now there, is vanished, right? And also there's the vanishing media of the letters that were all scrambled, and now they're there and it's as if they were always actually entailing cat. Uh, the entire time, you just had to move them around, right? And what's so important, what's interesting here, is that double move of the apprehension with the appearance of the gap, with a certain vanishing that happens all at the same time. And then it opens different horizons, which makes me think of how apprehending something is beautiful, even if you can't really um, ultimately justify the object of why it is beautiful, you apprehend it, and that opens a horizon that changes possibility that puts you in a different structure of thought, in the same way that once you apprehend the word, now you're in the hermeneutical circle. And there's something fascinating about that that structures the subject. But with that, Mr. Jockin, it's a pleasure to see you again, sir. I hope everything is well. These are great. I mean, good to see everybody. So, I mean... Obviously, you you line, you light this up with the discussion of philosophy of glimpses, but you know. So I've been doing all this. I'm doing this seminar series, preparing it for Plato on the beautiful and virtue, and I'm bringing this up because I'm I'm working on Phaedrus right now. So it's the it's the fourth dialogue I'm reviewing right now. It's incredibly fascinating uh, because I, I was going to point out, and also a little bit related to Critias as well, because the first thing pointed out. Is just related to the nature of language, right? Because I know that was used a lot. But here's the thing. A medium is used to communicate language, right? Just like line has to be, basically a figure has to be depicted through a line. But it was but what's fascinating is that a drawing, it's, sim, it's mesis, it's likeness of appearance to the thing represented is via figure. So it's the, it's, Basically, it's a precipitation, right? Coming closer or further away from a likeness by figure. Words and language operate actually much more extremely radically because there is what is the common trait between smudges of ink on paper, of absence and presence of inks and paper, or even sounds that compose it, which is ultimately written language is basically. In phonetic languages, it's basically it's similar to music composition. It's sound that our bodies are then produ are instructed to produce through aeration, contraction of the vocal cord, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, in either scenario, how are either of those like a cat? Nothing. So it's actually shocking. And by the way, in Curtillos, it's hilarious because Plato runs a point, like or Socrates really, the character of it, uh, plays a part of like trying to say, oh no, but onomatopoeia. Obviously, that's how everything comes from names because the sounds are like the shape, but that's ridiculous. Like that, it, it's it, it's a comedy to show how it's to demonstrate how unreasonable that argument is. So it actually leaves us in radical. I'm pointing out in Plato, he talks about is radical, like schism that is wild, you know. And you're saying substitution, but no, but that's but but that's the thing. But it's literally it's. I'm going to make the like this is from a Quranic point of view. So there's a line in the Quran that says. Um, God is nothing like creation in any way. And then, uh, and then with a fun note of saying that he's the all seen or hearing. So that's, it's a hilarious, it's a fun mind twist to point out that any mo if we, if that's acknowledged that God has no likeness to creation, in any sense, there is a gigantic infinite chasm of what, cre of reality of the creator and creation. Yet he is said to be the all hearing, all searing, the benevolent, the just, all these predications can be given of him. How are we to make sense of this? I mean, that just shows the insanity of what's going on here. One last note, and this ties to Phaedrus, because I more, more was more critical at that point. There is a gigantic line about basically cults, right? So cult, where it comes from, is worship. But in particular, there's different modes of it. Um, the Catholic Church has a huge dissection on it, right? Basically adoration, honor, and basically hyper-honoring, uh, if I had to summarize the points. Phaedrus has that too. It's the hierarchy of the gods. And it's actually in that point to say that by one becoming in similitude to the cult of the worship of that god, you become like that god. So it's a kind of uh, predication on excess. So because the divine is, is such a definite, it's called the definite excess of a different, hi of different hierarchies, different cults are oriented around becoming like that thing. Now, 
The difference between that and basically small communities being cults is that if they're not actually based on reality, they're actually ideologies instead. Because that's actually a very, which is the 18th century and 1800s invention. I, these are projects I have to address because that's actually the biggest problem. The biggest critique on Plato that it has to be addressed with this entire argument of a kind of objective beauty that's actually superior to wisdom, which is basically the project I'm trying to present here. That was what Plato's doing here. There's contentions. Some people make the argument there's an equivalence of the good and the beautiful and the true. I don't think so from the way Plato really presents his arguments um, or the dialogues. But the only way you're going to answer that question is to address the issue of ideology because ideology has a great power that you can make any justification you can just keep adding addendums to you oh i was wrong but no that's okay because we could just correct it with something else but these are all basically falseness so it's just error just multiplied on error and just self-annihilates because it's not based on reality and truth anyway so this was just me kind of dumping in have fun gang get in there <laughs> that, that is a marvelous comment i'll pass it to, to mr flores and then mr luber i am um, and i'm looking very much forward to your class uh, right. it will be a gift to the world. And now I'm thinking about the weirdness of when I see a point, I go point. When I see a line, I go line. But if I do scribbles, I don't know what it is. But then if I take those squiggles and make it the letter A, I know what it is. But then it's just a sound. And then if I put it in cat, and it's interesting how these all these different levels of the activation of a certain apprehension that with the letter A, it's just like, ah, oh, it doesn't mean anything. With cat, it's like there's a gap between cat and phenomenon. With a line, there's not a gap, but there's... But then I can scribble and it's not a line, it's just a scribble. There's something interesting there that I'm pondering, but let me give it to Mr. Flores and then Mr. Luber. Yeah, I wanted to comment more on the Phaedra stuff because, I mean, I've only read it once and then I listened to the audio book uh, or audio reading of it uh, once. But, like, Phaedra's ultimately, like, because you pointed out, like, there, it has to deal with language, right? Rhetoric, right, is the medium in that one because they're all trying to, like, uh, see who could, you know, gain the love of the boy or whatever. Um it, it has to do with desire, correct? And so um, how you're talking about how ultimately it's like trying to connect with the gods, right? And, and this form of excess. I think in that presence and absence of, of, of these signifiers in language, we, that's, this is what we get that combines um, any sort of discourse um, and can build from either an individual discourse, community discourse, um, and an ideology, which is the what Lacan and Zizek would call jouissance, which is that excess that's always in absence and kind of appearing too late, right? Never too soon, but always too late. But that is what the vanishing meteor is. And I just want to know what your thoughts are on that, because I really like how you pointed out the excess of the gods, because that's what the real is, is this libidinal excess that can't be contained in the symbolic order so it has to jettison it out but then it always comes back right yeah, we'll stack on i mean yeah this is great points because you're absolutely correct yes so the main pretense is the nature of love <laughs> but with a very fat i mean it's fascinating i mean because the general argument if you like a gorgias the reference point is gorgias read gorgias or protagonist and then you'll check against phaedrus you have a completely different argument for what rhetoric is right because uh I'm going to sidestep. I'm going to point that out. And I'm going to sidestep because I'm going to address the first point, which is, yeah, the question is basically the nature of love, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this was a, if you put that next to symposium, there's a really interesting question because in symposium, there's a little sleight of hand that happens mm -hmm. because the argument starts with the love of the beautiful, right? And the character Socrates doesn't know how to answer it. So basically, Diatima switches, does the switch say the good, and then thus the whole argument is predicated on that. And Socrates asks Ag Agathon that question. Do you consent that the good and the beautiful are the same? He says, yes. There's a fun line. This is my arguments about why I think Plato even is tricking, not tricking us, but just saying he's kind of giving us like a little mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't watch this carefully, you're going to sidetrack and miss the point. Right. Because he makes an argument based on, well, based on that argument. It's a probable statement he makes to agree to it. But anyways, I bring this up because Phaedrus completes continues the discussion of what is love what mm -hmm. is his actual nature um and that nature of the love it's actually four different kinds and in fact it's said to be the the most basically madness it's the actual power of and specifically the highest level of it is the love of the beautiful mm -hmm. which is a kind of remembrance of beautiful things in the reality in this world that 
pulls you to the higher world. It's actually a completely separate category from the level of the muses, for example, which would be like you think it'd be the obvious one, mm-hmm. or prophecy, or actually deviation from the fu- for the future. It's actually mm-hmm. fascinating what was what's put next to each other mm-hmm. in the same category. The other thing you point out, but now I'm going to say another part about that rhetoric part. Super fascinating because its purpose is to enchant the soul by knowing the soul of the other person by mm-hmm. what aligns to them by charms. Mm-hmm. to move them towards the beautiful basically ultimately actually ver- temperance mm-hmm. temperance shows up here mm-hmm. it's an informed opinion for the best which is, i find is a fascinating argument right. it's, it's obviously predicated into the kind of general like minimization like don't desi- don't have access to desire mm-hmm. but it's starting its first position is no you want the best like you desire the best reality possible which is what love is p- drawing you towards i think that's so just to kind of answer your points um, I think that that movement, that kind of, I also bring up this charm point because, um, I was in a reading group talking about specifically in symposium, the argument that, uh, if love is, a, is, a, is, a, is an indefinite medium, um, mean, and it's usually argue, and the reference is the right opinion is the reference point. So as right opinion is the indefinite mean of wisdom and ignorance, love is said to be an indefinite mean as well, but of what? kind of give a bunch of reference points right uh, and i actually asked the question to the group what's the intermediate of beautiful of the beautiful if it's, something's not ugly nor beautiful what's the intermediary it's obviously love that's one aspect of it but what way just like we can divide that up into knowledge the intermediary is right opinion what would what would what would beauty be as a as just like i was riffing on it this is before i got into phaedrus i actually said it's probably charm like when someone's charming mm-hmm. it has a kind of there's something intermediate about it. It's not beautiful. It doesn't have that first call of beauty, but it has that kind of, it calls for you. It has it literally a charming kind of nature to it. Uh, that could be, basically, it, it can be, you could be wrong, just like you could be wrong and right opinion. Or better said, it's not like you're wrong. It's just that you can't give an account for what you're doing and nor do you have any, any guarantee that that action you did once the first time is going to be correct the second time. So it has a kind of un- instability uh, on kind of tied to it a little bit indefiniteness anyways right oh, was this, i hope this was helpful and yeah just my meditations on what you're bringing up right and last thing i just want to comment on because you're bringing up the symposium is that like well seminar eight lacan's whole riff on the transference is mediated by the symposium and he kind of gives a whole historical backlog on all the, the, the characters in the dialogue and he mentions alcibiades yes. and he describes alcibiades as being this charming person you know the way he could overthrow kings or, or rulers or whatever and seduce women but yet like you could see this failed charm on Socrates in a sense, right? Or how would you describe it? Because he's yes, trying yes, to yes. Charm. There's, there's a term Lacan uses. Actually, I, just, I actually mentioned in an essay about this exact point. I'm blanking on the goddamn name. It means Greek statue. Um, um, literally, the idea is like the goodness that's inside that statue. And Socrates. Are you thinking irony, of the Agalma? Right? Thank you, Agalma. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, I was like, oh. it's like an AG. I just did forgot. Yes. So the whole point that is that it's this inner beauty. That is beyond the appearance. It's right. basically because the whole point of Socrates is like this disgusting, ugly man. <laughs> right. It's like right. you, should, you should think Alcibiades would be like nothing of interest with. But yet right. he's – and this is actually a very important line. He says, I am shamed and corrected by the goodness that is in this beauty that's inside this man. So it's this kind of coer- – there's statements that kind of like this. I'm, I'm kind of waxing. But there's a whole pretense about the nature of what – what was supposed to be love, that's what Agathon was supposedly giving a speech about when we found out that was not the case. Because all these things that supposedly love had, it doesn't have because it's a indefinite mean. Instead, I would argue it's beauty. And one of the things, it's that non-coercive force of compel of almost compulsion, but not in a violent way. But, you know, move on, move the hearts of men, right? Mm-hmm. I think lines like that. Uh, so yeah, th- absolutely. These are exactly the lines that I think Lacan borrows from that come with his arguments. Right. Later on. Totally agree with that. Excellent comments, Miss, Mr. Jockin. And Mr. Fishman, it's a pleasure to see you, sir. I hope that you are doing well. And now I am extremely curious to compare Phaedria's Gorgias and the symposium. That is extremely interesting. Um, I also completely agree that often there might be subtle moves going on in Plato. I always, when he's saying, hey, we're going to kick all the poets out of the Republic, and he just happens to be a poet who's writing in poetry. Isn't that interesting, right? Uh, so kicking and, out. The- sorry to interrupt you, but one point. One thing about that, in in Phaedrus, he says the highest hierarchy of the humans of the man, of of men's souls, philosopher, mm. musicians, 
artists. Yes, yes, that's exactly Fascinating. right. Fascinating. No, Fascinating. and it, well, I think Mr. Dr. Lakes, when he talks about the uh, the poets getting kicked out, he's pointing out poets that do not deal in philo philosophical matters, the true matters. It's these poets. To me, what he's talking about is almost sometimes people today will talk about the difference between the artist and the entertainer. You know, there's a difference between those. And maybe for Mr. Lubert's work, the story that has theme as opposed to story that then falls apart because it isn't bound by any sort of vertical causation if we use Wolfgang, Wolfgang Smith's language. And I think that's really, really important. It also brings to mind, you know, I've been thinking more and more how interesting he's like, hey, if you don't do geometry, get out. You better know geometry. Well, why? Well, because there's something about geometry that means mathematics cannot just stay in pure abstraction. It has to come to the concrete, right? It has to be shaped. It has to be brought in. And that brings in the great Descartes-Leibniz debate, right? Where Leibniz is like mathematics that doesn't ultimately have to come to the geometrical is going to be very problematic. Um, and it makes me think of like how there might be a little subtle, similar thing going on, right? And so it, it's important. I think there is a lot in Plato of those sort of um, moves where he's saying something, but he's also pointing. And it is curious. It's almost as if, and then I'll give it to Mr. Luber, it's almost as if beauty suggests that the true and good that is presented is actually good and, and true, right? Where you almost have to, because of the fact that you are locked in phenomenology, if you will, have to kind of say beauty's a little better because that is what you phenomenologically experience. And if you think good and true are equally as good, then you may go, oh, well, this is true over here. Two plus two equals four. Yeah, but it's not true in the geometrical way. It's not true in the full way, right? But beauty tends to be a signification in the phenomenological realm that this particular manifestation of true is the more holistic form of true, right? As opposed to maybe just true in a very simple and linear way, right? So it's almost like you have to give a kind of push or suggestion in the direction of beauty, especially for people that are in the phenomenological, because otherwise we tend to just go into trolley problems to determine the good, um, notions of true found in mathematicals and rationality. Whereas if we're forced to consider beauty as primary, that might be a way of almost keeping us from falling into the temptation of those mistakes, right? Which we have actually fallen into, the mistakes of what I call autonomous rationality, the mistakes of these kind of simple premises. But let me give it to um, Mr. Luber and then I'll give it back to Mr. Jockin, please. Very interesting stuff. I mean, for one, my philosophical education like my takeaway with plato was definitely that like beauty and goodness was definitely like equivalent so that i what, what you're saying is like kind of blowing my mind a little bit not gonna lie but um it's 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 making me think that when you're watching a sunset you call it beautiful it's because you're within the experience and that experience hit a, hits a significant type of marker it's a status where where it where you and the sunset meet and become almost one in a certain sense and you can just like die with the sunset and be okay with it um to me good also does that it's a de it's a description just like beautiful within an experience it it, it it's contained within an experience like beautiful but with the way you're talking about it, it's making me think that good doesn't, there's something, it doesn't reach your soul in a certain sense, where beauty does reach your soul. And that, and that, uh, that's very interesting. I, 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 I'm, I'm curious what you have to say about that. And just like, if, uh, you think that goodness doesn't have like an intimate relationship with like the soul versus beauty having an intimate relationship with the soul. I mean, it does. It's a great point. I, I really appreciate what you're saying, asking about this. The diff, the there's notes from Aristotle as well as Plato. Plato, I think he's a little oblique about it. It's an instrument of the, of the mind. So goodness is quality. It's basically qualified in what way? What so there's a kind of I always call I call it circumscription the kind of like my meta theme for like his entire discussion is the mode of circumscription. The one thing that makes the beautiful different from all from both truth and goodness is this power of generation. It's a kind of so when I I'll use an example by by meaning. So when we say something is true, especially in a mythical sense, especially there's a kind of flatting of meaning, subject predicate call it a day. And even, even a syllogism, it's not like 
Socrates, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Socrates is mortal, you know, et cetera. It's everything was pre-circumscribed. It's all there. You're just adding, you're basically continuing the line of what's already been circumscribed. The beautiful has that power to demand it's something beyond it. This is why this language of the definite excess is coming in because it's something that is more, it has overflow. When we hear words like abundance, uh, overflow, the cup of run of over, it, it shows that it cannot be limited in the same way as definitely the true, especially this univocal mode of the truth. Uh, and even the good, because the good is, is the kind is usually qualified by in what way in what mode um the area of overlap that is probably true with all three there's two parts one part is obviously pleasure which causes a lot of the confusions and problems is because pleasure tends to appear in all three phenomenon right so when we have when we get the truth we feel pleasure right we love having we love answering our questions ah. and we get something good we get the satisfaction of it ah, pleasure and we see beautiful things we tend to get pleasure out of it so thus the equivocation that all this collapses to pleasure is a, is a reasonable argument. And your job is then to explain what is slightly different about it or what's the distinctions to be made. But I want to be very fair that why it is reasonable to people collapse them. But then unfortunately, we're under hedonistic modes. Uh, that tends to be one of the problems if you cannot address it. Um, I think Aristotle is very fair to make the claim that it would seem very unfair that the good, the true and the beautiful would not have pleasure. It seems a little unfair, especially if ultimate virtue or if you get religious be the beatific vision, which by the way, I also noticed that the ultimate reality is not the true vision, the good vision. No, it's beatific vision. I always find that very interesting. This kind of subtle moves over there. Um, it would be, it would ought to be pleasurable. So there's a lot of work. There's, I'm not, uh, the work is to be done. There's a lot to be done because there's an incredible opportunity for misunderstandings. Um, I'm just saying that probably the, Besides circumscription being one of the major distinctions, that the beautiful actually commands to be more than, well, I would argue the other two have a circumscription quality to it. I would say probably related to that is that interaction where you led to your soul being part of it. It's the idea of wonder, awe, one, specifically wonder, I think it's my affair is trying to make, versus possession. When we want the truth of something, information, we tend to want it so we can circumscribe it. So again, I'm using circumscription again, but now in the mode of controlling, having, manipulating, having, which I, by the way, guys, uh, Sam, you were fantastic in the last net, loved it. This discussion, I thought that those questions were great there and the discussion about the hand. I wanted to jump in and just yell, manipulate, like the word manipulate comes from the Greek of hand. So it's that idea of like getting over, over something and owning it and possessing it and controlling it. Which is, by the way, one of the limitations of even the argument of diatema in Symposium, because it's the everlasting possession of the good. That's the argument being made, but uh, which would be the reference of the one, basically the creation, right? Basically possessing, right? Kind of desiring the, the lover for his beloved. But what about the relationship of the other side? So this is the issues of basically God, God's love for us. That's Aristotle is a better, gives a better account of that. Because God needs nothing from us, but yet he loves us. Why? Because it's the mode of a creator loving his creation. It's that, it's a completely different, it's not an ownership. It's a kind of wondering and presence with it. It's very different. It's a completely different orientation. So that's why, that'd be another way to talk about this idea of circumscription. Notice the kind of, when we, we wish to desire the good, we try to take it in, right? Kind of ugh, take it in, gulp it, consume it, right? And even the truth is Literally that kind of, I want the nose so I can control it and take it and manipulate it for my desires and purposes and machinations or whatever, or feel good about myself and superiority. Beauty, especially um, when it's treated, this maybe can be taken, con, maybe one fair point of con is, it's, an, it's not an intellectual detachment per se, but it's certainly a mode of, this is something I want to witness. Kind of your relationship with, your, with a loved one. Like when, especially like a child, your child, children or your, or your spouse, and they achieve some excellence, like they are just enacting it. Like I was with my best friend recent, like this past weekend, I saw their child talk. He was talking a lot. He's like three. He's like in that super talk mode. And it's just like a wonder to just see the activity of an intellect that's happening in front of me. It's delightful, especially someone I love and care about because he's a very close friend, you know, and I, because I love his kids because they're, uh, I love him and I've known him for 30 years. We grew up together. 
So that's what I meant. But like, I don't desire to possess the child. That's the point. So I want to point out that maybe there's new one. What you're making me think is so. Yes, like beauty is there's like a transcendent, there's like a excess amount aspect to it. But in order to see that, you have to be in a good position. Like you have to be in a good spot to see like something beautiful like strike you. So there's that, and it just is reminding me of like, is math created or discovered? It's it's the same type of uh, dynamic where it's like, you need to kind of invent, AKA put yourself in a position in order for a discovery to kind of wash over you. Um, is kind of, is what it's making me think. Um, like now I'm seeing beauty and good in the same dichotomy as creation and e invention. In terms and also in terms of uh, position and awareness, those 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 all seem to have, like like uh, like I never thought of beauty as a type of awareness. I guess would that would be the uh, the parallel. Correct me if I'm wrong too. If I'm, if no, you're right on the money. I mean, yeah. the, the reason my seminar is called the beautiful and virtue is because you must have virtue. You have to have it. Like it's a mo orient. You have to shape yourself to even be in a position to recognize it in the first place. Like it's told, like wow. that's absolutely yeah. on the mark. Uh, and by the way, I mean, if you don't know mathematics, if you don't, if we, if we present like very advanced calculus, does that, your, your inability to comprehend it, does that mean the truth isn't there in the mathematical equation? No, you just aren't able to apprehend it. You're literally not ready to take it in. So it's exactly 100% right. I think that's a very fair uh, thinking through of some of the consequences of what's being said. Totally right on the money. Beautiful. And let me give it to Miss Willem. I just wanted to say that the phrase die with the sunset sounds like a band album. We need to make that album. I'll play harmonica. Anyone else want to do drums? Drum harmonica. I think we can make it happen. Miss Willem, please. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. Um, so I wanted to like complicate this whole topic by trying to get at it from a completely different direction and a completely different framework. And Thomas, I'm hoping you'll have a lot to say on this because uh, recently we both went through um, a close reading together of uh, creative evolution. And um, one thing, I mean, there's a lot that, that, that text covers, but one thing that really interests me and sort of stuck in my mind was um, he has this whole section that is about the difference between um, instinct or intuition and intelligence. And um, he argues that uh, mankind is sort of like the locus of the, um, of, of, is like the, the being of creation who best exemplifies intelligence, which is based on um, treating the world as spatially and geometrically. So he says like logic is itself like based on immobile, solid, fixed um, geometrical objects. And we, I think you, I think we kind of covered a lot of that thought last week on the net when we talked about just the, the corporeality of concepts and, and the spatialness of concepts. Um, then on the other hand, he's got this idea of um, instinct or intuition. Um, and he says it's best exemplified by insects, which I thought that was interesting. Um, and he marks as an example like this, I think the horsefly and how the horsefly as a larva gets gets born onto like some certain plant that bees like, and then the larva squiggles its way onto a bee and it gets taken to like a hive and eats the, it gets put into a little honeycomb cell where a baby bee is, and then it eats the bee and the honey, and then it emerges as a house or a horsefly. So, it, you know, like how would as an individual or even as a species, like a, being like a horsefly, be able to know that, you know, if it goes, if it moves up onto the leaf in a certain way, it's going to be taken by a bumblebee to a place where there'll be food. Like there's so many things to know in that to be able to intelligently or instinctually um, to, to be able to successfully perform that feat. Um, so one, the reason I bring it up here is because at some point he says like, both of these faculties of knowing were present in germ form in creation all the way as it branched forth into inst 
insects and humans. And actually humans don't not have instinct. We just are disproportionately intelligent rather than instinctual. Um, but he says, it was really an offhand comment, but it stuck in my mind. He says that the aesthetic faculty in man is evidence that instinct is still present with us. And I thought, you know, like, I don't know how it, to directly um, link this to all your former comments, but I think like this, there's a lot of like, there seems to me to be a parallel between the not knowability of instinctuality and this like excess and um, like the wonder also, like uh, there's a quote in it in Creative Evolution. It's something to the effect of, um, uh, uh, there are things which intelligence cannot know but will question, but which instinct could know and will never question. Um, and then he goes on to say like, uh, instinct is, is shaped on the motions of life, unlike intelligence, which is shaped on like solid, immobile, fixed uh, geometrical objects. Um, instinct moves with life and knows the intimate secrets of life. It's he, the, the elan vital that he understands as moving through creation. Um, yeah, like it may be the, these knowings, this knowing the sunset dying into the sunset. It's like a living knowledge of the sunset or, or that is sort of dormant within us. And further on in the section, um, uh, Bergson says like he, he kind of suspects that a union of these two faculties of knowing would be more ideal, um, like a good direction for creation, so to speak. And he thinks that actually like man may one day, he, he overcame in, in, intellectual not knowing, and he might be able to double back into um, instinctual knowing and then be able to question and know, like sort of the things he cannot question, he can know. Yeah, so um, I, th I don't know, I just thought this was, sorry, this was also kind of long, but um, I felt like this perspective, it might be a new way, like doorway into the topic. Um, yeah, it's good to say. Well, that was fantastic. Wonderful incorporation of Berkson. And then I'll pass it to Mr. Flores and then Ms. Bath to Mr. Mr. Jockin. I, um, it's very interesting now because there's all this talk about being embodied again, re-embodied, get back to the body. And now it's almost like get back to the instinct. And how interesting to think that there's some sort of possible cross-pollination between intellectual faculties, instinctual faculties, and these somehow have some sort of emergence of aesthetic faculty, perhaps, or it would be quite curious to consider those together. So lovely incorporation of Burton. Um, I'm now thinking, so, you know, we were talking about this question of um, wisdom cults versus wisdom commons. How does one avoid a wisdom cults? And now based on Mr. Jockin's comments, I'm thinking about wisdom cir um, cir cir circumscription, where there's something about how do you create a limit on it so that you don't end up because a cult is kind of funny a cult becomes a cult you know when we say cult we say we think in our mind kind of small group of crazy people i'm sorry you know a small group of people but funny enough a cult is one that actually doesn't see any limits to its thinking right like it can be incorporated everywhere all the truth can be found there it's all that you need you know no one in the cult would directly say that but practically speaking, that's how they functionally sort of operate, right? And so it's interesting to think about beauty because this question of beauty, truth, and goodness in the relation seems to have a lot to do with this question of how to keep, um, to avoid these wisdom cults, right? And if indeed, to go back to the original, you know, what we were saying at the beginning, if the larger system makes it very difficult for these smaller communities to test themselves so that they don't undergo auto cannibalism like the store conversation was going in, Thinking this relation of beauty, truth, and goodness, and how to impose some sort of wisdom circumscription seems like it would be very necessary. So there would be internal processes on these groups so that they do not end up in these more um, problematic directions or even cancerous, as we use Mr. Um, Mr. Ebert's language. And um, it is quite curious how the good restricts, but the beauty simultaneously suggests something beyond that restriction 
that then perhaps makes you live according to that restriction, not as oppressive, but a necessary conditioning. So you grasp, grasp the excess beyond that restriction. And thus you get a balance between givens and releases in a Philip Reef sense, maybe a, even a balance between instinct, instinct and intellect or rational. You know, I like to talk about rational and non-rational, a sense of the rational, but there's something beyond the non-rational, but I have to stay within the rational while simultaneously understanding it cannot be autonomous or then it becomes auto cannibalistic. That's a word that means cannibalizing your Yourself. It's great for the kids. They love it. Uh, animal cannibalism. So you don't want to go beyond yourself. Um, and yet you need to, it's this double act of the beauty suggesting an excess that you need the good to make an excess because you're restricted from and if there wasn't a restricted, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be an excess, right? Because there's no restriction to be an excess of and it's this double imposition of there's something holding you back that in holding you back suggests something more. That seems to be really necessary for these groups or dynamics or even just the formation of the subject to not have a problematic relation with pleasure. Because as you were saying, Mr. Jock, in all three of these, the true, the good, the beauty, have a certain pleasure to it. And in having that pleasure, there's the possibility of that pleasure leading to problematic relations to that pleasure. But if you get all three, it seems to have a way to keep that pleasure from turning into something more um auto cannibalistic because now i'm just trying to say the word auto cannibalistic as much as possible because it's my new favorite word um it seems to balance that but then it's interesting because there's something about beauty that seems like it has to have a special check mark by it because we are phenomenologically bound and thus beauty would be a certain organizing principle that we're actually dealing it's funny it's like beauty has to be primary precisely because we have to follow it to the place where beauty, truth, and goodness are all in operation. It's almost like a self-sacrifice occurs in beauty. It's like, it's the thing that leads you to the place where it's equal in a way, or that it's balanced. But you, but in a way it's unequal because it has to come first, but it's unequal precisely to bring you to a place where you see them all together. Maybe something like that is at play that I'm now thinking. Uh, but I really like the comments you made, Sam, on Berkson. That, that was tremendous, but let me give it to Mr. Flores. Mr. Flores, please. Yes. Uh, so I, I want to keep on that frame of thought that Sam brought up and kind of even throw it back at you, Sam, with something even, you know, along the lines with with Bergson and not just instinct in, in, in the intellect and even that excess of the instinct that goes towards like, as you would you say, the aesthetic, but what Deleuze has to say in his uh, essay, Instinct and Institution in which we just don't have instinct, but we create an institution of our instinct, which goes beyond even the Bergsonian notion that when you look at, for instance, he talks about the tick, the tick has just, I think he says like three sorts forms of instinct, the instinct of, of feeling, uh, like he talks about tactileness, uh, smelling, and then, you know, tasting or feeding. So its ability to feel the, the grass uh, pedal or the blade. And then once it, it feels or senses the horse, or animal, it falls and then lands onto feet. But then you have uh, us with our instincts, but we institutionalize them, we condition them, we domesticate them with different forms of institutions where it's not that we just eat, but we have to create kitchens, uh, you know, households to constantly uh, recirculate this instinct of, of feeding. Or when it comes to uh, knowledge, we create academies we create universities right so that's one aspect to think about that but then you have the lacanian aspect that talks about or freudian aspect we don't have instincts we have drives in this essay of instincts of the vicissitudes he questions the scientific validity of the term instinct we have the symbolic order and language thanks to lacan and the fact that instincts or drives are already pre-established by the symbolic order and its structuration. Um, Isabel Millar brings this up in saying that the two structural drives that are not in any way, sh shape, or form uh, correlated to uh, our biological drives, like the oral anal, are the scopic and the invocatory drive. Those are structural, and that these are forms of excess that produce jouissance and more uh, discourses. So, for instance, now we're doing dealing with jouissance and enjoyment and, and death drive. So we have different forms of excess that are not based upon instinct, but creating institutions um, like the university discourse, the mastery discourse, you got the hysterics discourse. And then finally, you know, the um, uh, psychoanalytics discourse that uh, dis destroys or dismantles all forms of mastery. But there's the fifth one, 
uh, uh, Tom Samo Tomsik, it's uh, he has it. It's called um, the capitalist discourse, right? Which blurs the lines between you know any form of other discourse because it's all about pure enjoyment of the objet petit a and all its libidinal excess. So my kind of way to throw it back to you is to think out of two forms. On the one hand, the delusion with instinct and institution, and the other one with uh, jouissance and discourse and how it creates institutions. So I'll give it to Mr. Jock. And I'm always impressed, Mr. Flores, how you can say all the Lacanian terms correctly, because I struggle to say wabbit instead of rabbit. So I'm really impressed. I actually failed kindergarten and went to T1 because I would start words with W's with an R and vice versa. And to this day, I don't have flashbacks. Honest promise. Oh, gosh. Um, it's quite curious. I wonder if drives are fallen instincts. And maybe perhaps like it's kind of like they're fallen. And now maybe precisely we can have the aesthetic possibility because we can negate sublate those fallen instincts into something aesthetic, right? Is there some sort of like fallen, if I give that theological language to instincts into drives? And because of that, it's actually possible um, to have the aesthetic experience, which is a bringing together of the intellectual and the instinctual in a Bergsonian sense, of which if you didn't have that fallen, um, fallen instinct into drive, you wouldn't need to use intellect to figure out how to bring in the instinct or the non-rational so you could have the aesthetic experience. But I love that point. Um, and like I said, I'm actually not lying about about failing kindergarten anyway mr jockin yeah just to kind of so sam obviously we were we did the reading group together on berkson it was a great great project i'm glad we did that together so actually and i we talked about this privately we said oh so berkson's got some great ideas they all came in like 1900 1910 basically from that point on so he because the because actually since then i started investigating from there i mean i really wrote attractor fields basically strange attractors. I mean, that's basically what's going on here is idea of like the end of, it's a causal relationships that are uh, not actors and act basically acting, acting upon. It's actually like the environment, basically these kind of interdynamic relationships that generate all these interactions, which have seem to have the appearance of, of intelligence happening. Um, so I wrote a note on that, which then, you know, that commented before about, you know, instincts and institutions, and like basically like desires like eating, you know, going to the bathroom, all the other stuff. Well, I wrote affordances because from a design perspective, I bring up because Sam, we're both in the design field. So this is an area where basically what we're doing all day, we're introducing affordances into spaces all day, every day. That's like what we're doing, which are literally in one, you want to make the argument can be attractor fields in one sense because they literally are not, they're a causal. Tend to be, they usually are just either passively, completely passively interacted, or they're instrumental, like they're an instrument use. What would perfectly mean the definition of an affordance. So, like we, a certain we have a certain power of cutting, of like action, of hitting with a hammer, like hitting something, and then we use a hammer, it amplifies, right? As an example, an affordance we have, we have to to consume food. Effectively, cooking is ultimately an affordance of our digestion. It's it's a digestion out of the body for our, for ourselves. So we we can obtain more nutrients from the food, for example, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just, I bring all that. So that's just like a tangent note of just interest right there. So that's super fascinating. Um, also, I just bring that up because I'm with um, Bethany Taber, uh, we're doing, a, I know she's great. She's fantastic. We're doing, I'm doing a reading group with her on, we did basically Jung's uh, synchronicity and he goes over, he had, it's fun because then we actually got right through a section. It talks basically like a causal connection. So things that are not in this mode of act, action and acted upon, which by the way, Aristotle has actually four. He points the two ones we just stated, Poignot and Pashten. But then there's two others, basically what's called chance. And then there's like basically divine intervention that we don't know about. Uh, that So he listed four and Jung kind of reinforces that point, quoting Avicenna, Ibn Sinna, and uh, in his text, he, it, it, it's Magnus Albert, Albert Magnus, which for the context, that's Thomas Aquinas' uh, teacher. I looked into it afterwards. I, we, most scholars think that's a pseudo name. That's a pseudo name. It's not the actual person, but all of them are talking about the important, basically actions of magic. I bring this up because the, the, the uh, my comment about affordances are coming from ontological design, which Daniel, I know we, you've read as well. There's a section about magic in the very end. Basically, there's like a whole tangent note about that and invocations. It's just, uh, I just find that just an interesting kind of point about what is the role of design. Because in general, actually, from a design ethics point of view, 
we we actually both I me and Sam talked this privately. Uh I'll speak for myself. Sam can correct me if I'm wrong and my understanding for her. Um we kind of feel this kind of complete lack of like a flaccidness that what we do has no knowledge or actual effects or any reality to it. But we feel like, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. There is something there. It just hasn't been, it has not been explored and has not been actually really pursued. Uh, I think these kind of under, because we have a tentatively usually a kind of causal relationship, action, action upon, and usually the, the built environment and the instruments of basically physical design objects, let alone cognitional designed objects, which is what communication design, typography, all these things are doing. Um, they're just passive instruments or just completely irrelevant to the lived experience of people's lives and how they act. But I think when you think, when you think about affordances, attractor fields, and these kind of discussions of how we're acted upon, we're, we're acted upon in a very, in a, a causal way that may be more, that's much more subtle than the normal modes we think about. Um, I think that's worth investigating and talking about. I also bring this up because Sam, your point about instinct and intelligence, there's, so from Symposium and also mentioned in Phaedrus is this idea of the science of the beautiful, which is superior to even wisdom, which for Plato, a Plato text is absurd. That's crazy. That's crazy, dog. Like, you want to talk about, this is basically equivalent of like seeing Enigea in an Aristotle text. You should like stop everything you're doing when you see Enigea being mentioned. I bring this up because in rhetoric, uh, Enigea is brought up. That's freaking wild is what, when I see that. Because you think, how could this, when you see that, it means ultimate reality. That's for Aragana, for Aristotle. When we talk, when we read Plato, when we see wisdom, we're like, whoa, this is the big dog. This is the big stuff. This is what he really cares about. If you present, if you take that dialogue to say there's something superior to wisdom, what would it be? And if it's the signs of the beautiful, that doesn't make images of, re, of the beautiful, it makes realities of it. I mean, that's insane. Uh, it would have to be this kind of science that would have this kind of understanding of because the idea of the instinct is the idea of like its particularity. It's this kind of, I mentioned, I talk about it sometimes that beauty has this really interesting quality because it's not really like abstract concepts are beautiful, like dog. That's not the thing we're getting at here. It's a particular dog, a particular sunset, a particular tree. It's like a, there's a demand of hexity, uh, hexicity in it. It has to be this particular, it's a particularity demand in it. Yet it also calls out this beautiful that is actually superior and in, uh, in a definite excess beyond it. That's what, so that's a quality that is inherently different from any other mode of investigation. And let alone even apprehending it. Could you imagine having the rea power of reality to create it? So I use an example with some of my students talking about it. This would be an analogy of like doctors having the science that enacts health, for example. If a doctor made a picture of health, that's not health. That's ridiculous. I mean, that'd be plastic surgery. Actually, meditating on afterwards is plastic surgery. Or bodybuilding, in my opinion. You actually know that the average age of a bodybuilder is like 40 years old, like 45. It's crazy. Yeah, because they're all the drugs they're on. It's insane. So they have the appearance of this powerful, great health, but they're literally destroying their bodies and their average life expectancy is a joke. It's completely ridiculous. It's destroying themselves uh, very clearly. So that's an example where it, that's an image, an appearance of of health that is clearly not reality. More gymnastics, better said. But anyways, um, so to take that. So let's so because the usual example we see with the signs of the beautiful, we would say, is it a painting? No, because that's just a depiction. It's just an image. No, this it would be realities, which then leads to another. What would be this reality of the beautiful? It's a fact. I, I get so excited about this stuff because it's so crazy. Uh, so I just point out that I think that I'm drawing this out because there's powers of the intellect of kind of abstraction and specific and kind of blocking things and a kind of circumscription versus instincts kind of working with a flow outside kind of beyond circumscription that is particular though. It's actually very fascinating because you usually see that a kind of deadening kind of abstraction would be a particularity, but it's not. It's actually the opposite. It's kind of a kind of a zoom out kind of quality that actually denies the beautiful. I say this too because I see it with students when they get too abstracted. They're treating their artifacts as an abstraction. They're not looking at a particular as a particular layout or composition or whatever. Gone. They don't. They can't. They can't see the beauty. Uh, yeah, what Andrew was here because that's literally that point about like, like you have to attune yourself and have virtue to even apprehend the beautiful, be in a position to get it. That's a great example of it when we're in kind of deading abstraction of kind of me mechanistic thinking. It, you lose that power. You completely just like. And by the way, I. 
even as a professor, as an instructor in, in design, I have, if I'm like working through grading, I'm just like power throughing. If I'm not paying attention, I can sometimes like lapse out and not realize like that the particularities of a type of, of, of color and typography and composition and all the other particulars that are the subtleties of what makes something beautiful. Anyways, so I'm going to stop there. Beautiful comment. Um, it's very interesting on what you're saying. There is something about beauty that drills down to the particular and then pulls it up. You know, it's this weird down up that occurs, right? And it's that it's not because it has to, it feels like the beautiful is coming into the particular. And then when it was in its apprehended in the particular, that suggests it's part of something more than just that particular. It's a very strange movement that occurs there. I like this phrase, the science of beauty. Um, for me, uh, if we're thinking phenomenology as a science, blah, 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 for rehearsal or whatever, like to think of, for me, phenomenology has always been at its best when it is asking the weird experience of beauty. Like, so for example, when you experience something beautiful, does pleasure come first or apprehend beautiful and then pleasure, right? These sort of subtle questions seem to be really important because if we've talked about one of the reasons people can end up in cults is precisely because pleasure comes to, oh, we have the secret knowledge no one else has and the pleasure comes first. And then you call, oh, we have a beautiful community. Like you can watch a movie like Midsummer's, which is pretty friggin' weird, but it's actually a brilliant movie uh, where the beauty almost comes after the um, elitism of being in the group, right? The, you know, a lot of cults would say they had a beautiful group, but then phenomenologically, as a sci if I say a scientific investigation, perhaps we can ask, okay, but did the pleasure and the feeling of belonging come first and then you started calling it beautiful? Or did you apprehend it as beautiful and then found pleasure in it? I wonder if these almost sort of phenomenological descriptions can provide certain indications of if one is involved in something more like a community, a cult, or now I'm thinking, like I mentioned earlier, a wisdom circumscription, because that's quite interesting to me. The other thing that's very interesting about beauty is, uh, first off, I was going to mention earlier to Miss Willem's point, the extraordinary Michel Planier, his book, Tactile, um, Tactile Knowledge, which is a masterpiece, personal knowledge. He was a really smart guy. He was so smart that nobody read them. Uh, that's usually what happens if they're too good. Uh, so, you know, uh, and I was also going to say that I feel really, really, I'm always amazed by designers such as y'all. Um, I don't know the metrics of gauging great design or how they do that, but I always am like, if someone has a great creative idea because of the way you design the room, they may never realize that it was because of that design or the font or whatever that had that idea. So they never attribute it to the design. And so you're the silent servants that are helping push people or motivate people in directions to think things they otherwise would never think. But then they don't necessarily think that it was that design that made them think that, that background. So I salute you for submitting yourself to such an undertaking because that is not easy. Um, usually if I can directly hand my, my son a pineapple apple sandwich he knows the source of the goodness and so he thanks me but if you are the source of the pineapple sandwich metaphorically speaking um they don't know do not ask why i made the example of a pineapple sandwich and so the last thing i'll say and then pass i know right actually actually i went on the porch one day and he said i want you to eat that and i said what is it he said eat it yes sir pop this is like the best sandwich ever what in the world is this man and he's like well it's white bread pineapple and mayonnaise and I was like, wow, this is amazing. But you see, you had to step in to know the taste, which required a certain vulnerability in the same way that you have to condition yourself, not knowing that that's going to enable you to apprehend the beauty of the pineapple mayonnaise sandwich. So there is a relation of developing the willingness or the courage, the virtue, so that you may step into the beauty uh, that otherwise would not be possible. So if you're ever hungry, a mayonnaise pineapple white bread sandwich is amazing. I'll give it to Mr. Willem. The last thing um, I was going to say, there's an ex another extraordinary book that nobody read. Uh, Cardinal Newman's Grammar of Ascent, he makes this wonderful example where he says, hey, isn't it funny that you can know, like, imagine the mother telling the child a Shakespeare sonnet, and the child has no understanding of what it is, but he does intuit that it's beautiful, and precisely because of that intuition that it's beautiful, the child can then be motivated to try to understand it. And what Cardinal Newman, he's actually making a very important epistemological case that you can apprehend before you understand. And in fact, the sense of 
that there's something here is precisely what guides knowledge. You assent that this is there's something here because it is beautiful. Then you work your understanding, which gets you to a place where you're conditioned for a new ascent that you can understand on and on and on. He calls that the grammar of ascent. And what's so interesting about that, you could ask the following phenomenological question. What is it you are experiencing when you apprehend that Shakespeare's sonnet is beautiful, but you don't understand it? And that I find particularly interesting because you can't say it's the presence of truth because you don't know what it means. You can't say it's the presence of goodness because you don't know that it's good. And yet you apprehend something. There's this mysterious apprehension of something that then guides your other faculties to want to translate it into terms of good and truth. And what you were saying earlier about beauty having to come first, I, did, I was thinking of that example from Cardinal Newman, where he's like, Beauty has to come first or else you would never assent that there's something there worth understanding and bringing into terms of good and truth. So I think Cardinal Newman is quite magnificent on that. And there is then, I guess, the sacred romance, the sort of calling of, come on, come on, there's something here. There's something here. And, and it's curious to consider those things. But let me pass it on to Miss Willem, please. So just to address what you just said, I really felt like that experience exactly describes how I felt when I read The Winter of Our Discontent by Steinbeck because I kept at the end of it I was like asking myself like what is this about like what is this about like okay I get it like it's Easter he like he's he's discontented he plans robbing a bank and then he doesn't but at the end and, and he's talking to to canned fruit in his store I don't, I don't know the whole thing at the end I was just like, but what is it about? Like, you know, and the ending is really un, like not an ending. I, that's cause sort of like, I don't know. And it was just like, it was just like, come on, come on. There's, there's something, there's something. And, and I love that. I, like, I kind of loved that. I never felt like I got it, you know? <laughs> um, so that was, I just really liked hearing you say that it, it really, it, it is, it's such a nice feeling actually. Um, but okay. So to take this back, actually, like way back, I wanted to, I kind of, I wanted, I guess I wanted to put an architectural lens on um, Andrew, what you were saying, and Thomas, what you were saying. So, um, so this thought that like, you know, I never really thought of this, but I, I, again, I like things that are sort of opposite. Um, the idea that instinct flows into uh, institutions is kind of really weird. Um, and then what you were saying, Thomas, about um, how like instinctual thinking, how a lot of this is kind of went forward, like it came forward in human thought towards, um, towards like magical acts or like a causal influences. And the two, like these two concepts, when they, we put them side by side in the conversation, it really made me think of the work of my um, thesis advisor, uh, Alberto Perez Gomez. He wrote a book called Attunement, um, another one called Built Upon Love. And I think his main thought in his work, he's an archetypal historian, so he's probably not very familiar in these circles, but um, uh, one of his main points is that, um, is that uh, like, uh, Kind of the highest aspiration of an architect, he says, is to um, articulate atmospheres which are attuned to the focal actions which they um, surround, environment which they hold. Um, and so I, this, I felt like it, it is kind of the uh, creating atmosphere, articulating spatial atmospheres or backgrounds like you were talking about, Daniel. Um, it kind of is like just creating a field, right? Like um, when you step into a restaurant and um, it's an a-causal field, like maybe you had a stressful day, but the lighting is warm and the sounds are jazzy, you know, like the, the jazz of like clinks of plates is really lovely sometimes. And it brings you into a rhythm and there's smells and there's, you know, whatever the architect has done. I don't know, you know, there's colors, like it's a whole like, milieu into which you into which your being goes and then <laughs> and, and so this is kind of like the ontological design um concept like but working um sort of in silos in space in cities and then and then you know 
uh, like institutions then come and like fill those out and there's like I think we see in memes the fact that there's like really predominant atmospheres to certain institutions like I mean there's like a Wall Street vibe and there's like an academic vibe you know like and um <laughs> and these vibes can kind of sometimes like constitute these weird like cult like communities you know like um I just know why I keep thinking of it but there's this meme that's um <laughs> it's like a, I don't e I can't even reference anything memes are like the hardest thing in the world to reference but it's like um elite dad memes where there's these men in like collared shirts and puffer vests and they're all just like how are you doing Stanley oh good to see you wonderful yes so oh, oh, just got to call goodbye like I don't know there's such like an elite like, like this elite dad vibe and it's like somehow related to the institution of fatherhood like the like the the meme of the meme plex of of a certain type of father who has a certain type of job and like occupies certain types of 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 houses and like cars you know it, it's like this this total like not particular particular like very particular not particular um that that, that I'm just like I guess this very not particular this or sorry this very particular not particular I guess is like what I'm finding when we're when we triangulate like atmospheres a causal influence and like instincts as intuitions is it it's sort of, it's very aesthetic right like um I think I guess all I can say I'm I have a hard time when I come on here and then I, I begin like reflecting on what I've heard from you guys and then bringing my own thought into it and then at the end I'm like I'm always like I don't know how to conclude I never know how to conclude but I'm just going to conclude with this I don't know how to conclude statement Sam, you always bring stuff so awesome that it's open and that to conclude it would conclude the awesomeness. So we don't want to conclude the awesomeness. We want to <laughs> share it all around. And I am, I absolutely love the incorporation of the notion of vibes and means. It's interesting if, you know, there's a lot of talk ontologically about fields, like is the, is vibes a form of fields? Um, and it's curious to think of memes and cults going together. Uh, because that see, there is something about memes having a potential community of getting, oh, I get that meme. I get that language. Also, your meme last week was amazing. Uh, that meme last week was freaking amazing on the neck conversation. Oh, I laughed so hard. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting too with that is that there's something about, now I'm wondering if, if memes capture a certain vibe, could you do like vibe studies? Where you could see what certain vibes are alive online and cross communicating and what's attracting people. And if this cross pollination of vibes emerges to something that can't be found in those vibes that then attract certain people. Like we had that conversation about lo-fi music, which I always find amazing why lo-fi music is so popular today, because it seems to speak to something in its vibe. That gets to where people feel like they are at today in, say, late modern capitalism, looking for this. How do I get into a kind of trance state so I can just be at the computer for hours and forget I'm there or get in a trance state of computer, like just kind of being there to sort of be taken away somewhere? So what does lo-fi say about the kind of architect of the society today that people feel like they're seen at or that they fit into? And to think in terms of like comparative literature, comparative vibe comparative digital architect. Um, that's quite curious to me. And then also what I was thinking about, and then I'll give it to whoever wants to speak as we come in on the last 15 or 20 minutes. I fear I must go in about 15 or 20. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you for coming at this different time. I really appreciate that. I, I find it also very interesting in Lynchburg, they have these pianos during those um, spring that are outside. Instead of inside, they put them downtown like outside and they're everywhere. And how this creates, like, why is it a piano outside? is different than a piano inside because it creates an entirely different vibe when you walk down the street, right? And you hear somebody playing piano down the road or whatever, it completely transforms the experience because there's piano music that you could have just as well heard inside, but now that it's outside, it creates a different vibe and it makes the city feel different. It feels like you're in a different place, right? And so the question I guess would be, is it possible to use the power of means, uh, you know, to create vibes and fields to work us against wisdom cults in favor of wisdom 
circumscriptions to pull us into a place where we apprehend to a beauty that's in excess to what defines that place as defined by a good and a true that we have to be charactered in order to realize that if we don't, we're either going to be too enclosed, therefore have nothing in excess that's transcendent calling us beyond ourselves, or it's going to be too chaotic because it's beyond ourselves. And what would it look like to create memes? So maybe we all need to take Mr. Jockin's class that he's doing and make memes about it to pull people toward it that will have a vibe in favor of Plato, Aristotle, and the classics that will then create a field of knowledge that sees in its very limitation the excess that calls us forth to something more. So we're going to create memes for Mr. Jockin's class. I think platonic meme magic sounds wonderful to me. Mr. Jockin, we are happy to be of service. And it's not for money. It's for the good, the true, and the beautiful. So we are glad to do that. So please, if anyone has final comments, please. Hey, listen, I mean, I, I believe Michelle is very strong in her meme game. I've seen some good work by her. So I'm expecting some very strong platonic meme magic from Michelle. Just want to put that note. I, I, I'm glad everyone enjoyed my... Crazy amount of reading I've been doing. I've been like obsessed with this stuff and reading nonstop, like mad. Sam knows who's we're an accountability group together. So I've been this on this march for like six months now at this point. Um, really appreciate this conversation. It's been really enlightening. Very I'm always energetic to talk about these topics. And it was fun to see at Lacani and Platonic intersection too. So that was really fun. I got some meme inspiration now too for my page as well. So <laughs> look forward to doing that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe I can say something here. It's been really good uh, listening to you guys. I've really enjoyed this conversation a lot. I think, uh, Daniel, what you were saying about how beauty brings us to, like, the need for uh, a limit imposed by goodness and truth, I thought that was really insightful. You know, like, beauty captures us in a way that that uh, truth and goodness don't. But it all the problem with that is that it captures us, you know. What I mean, and it can like you can fall, you can there's the siren. You know I mean, there's the beautiful thing that that turns you astray. And so it has to then be like contained by goodness and truth, which makes you appreciate those things. And so yeah, I thought that was a really interesting insight. I thought the insight about how like drives are a fallen instinct, too. I thought that was really, really interesting. And just I mean, the whole the whole notion of fallenness in this whole conversation, I think, is really central because like you could say that, like, if you're going to take that that frame of the garden and the fall, you could say that in the garden, there is no need for intelligence. There is no need for any sort of, like, work to, to uh, mediate the relationship between instinct and the objects around you. Yeah, I mean, it's like everything was just there. The food just grew on the trees and you could just have it. And, like, now that we're in this fallen world, it's like our instincts don't match up to the world. You know what I mean? We have instincts for things that are no longer there. Like the Sam was talking about how the, the insects have this instinct to go to a particular flower or whatever it is. And it's like, we have that instinct, but the flower is gone. And so what do we do? You know what I mean? And we're just sort of driven forward, but the object that we were supposed to be driven towards is no longer there. And so we're caught in this thing. And the whole process of like reconstruct, like the whole process of going forward as you're talking about creating means by which to facilitate vibes that can then uh, facilitate a harmonious relationship with the world, that whole work, I think, is to sort of like to either bring back the objects, you know, it's, it's not bring back, though, it can't be a regression, you know, what I mean, we don't want to just go back to like an instinctual world in the in nature, right, but it's like, there's some way that we can realign our instinct towards an end that can actually be met in a in a good and healthy way. Um, and I think that that's, that's what religion is supposed to do, um, is to sort of like create that field in which instinct and intelligence can then be united. So anyways, really, really great conversation. I really enjoyed everything. Thank you, everyone. That was great. You're a beautiful man, Mr. Fishman. And I can tell you that if you would like to return to a state of pure instinct, lose electricity in the middle of winter with three small children... It is a wonderful <laughs> return to the animal kingdom. Uh, and who knew that eating Campbell's soup under a table in the living room was the most fun on planet Earth. So I, yeah, I can say, well, it is also interesting because it's almost like when you have a vibe, that is an example of apprehending like the Shakespeare sonnet. Like, like when you listen to lo-fi music and you're doing work. It's like you apprehend that you're like, oh, I'm getting, I'm apprehending that I'm in a mood, 
that then is making me flow, that is making me creative, and that then that's pulling me forward. And if I keep doing this, then maybe some of the ideas I'm trying to arrive at, the truth or the good will come forth, right? And it's interesting to think of looking for a vibe um, as searching for a place where you apprehend there's something that then you follow that brings you to a goodness, maybe a good date. Or you're in a library and it creates a vibe that then brings you to the truth of the paper. And it's almost like there's, I guess I was making that example because it's almost like you have an instinct or something that if you need to go to the place with the vibe, like if you're trying to write a paper, it's like, it's interesting. Like, why is it sometimes you like, I need to leave the office and go to like go downtown to write the paper. Like you almost know it. Like you just feel the energy is not in the office. You need to go and sit at a table outside in the city. And that's where, and it's true though. This is the thing. It's actually true. You literally write the paper better when you go there. Why is it when you were at home that you had a sense of that? Maybe it's habit. I mean, I'm not saying I know the answer to that, but it's weird how every now and then you get a sense that you need to go to a place to finish this work. As if you have an instinct that you know to go to a place with a certain vibe because that's where the whole Cardinal Newman thing occurs, right? Where you feel the beauty and then you are seeking the beauty that then pulls you to the place where the good, the true, the true and beautiful come up of what you're working on. I find that very curious, that sense of, I've heard people say, go where the energy is, sense the energy. What is that? It seems to be almost instinctual. It just made me think of what Sam was saying with Burks. And it's very curious to kind of put your finger on what is the faculty that you are using when you feel that you need to go downtown to enter the downtown vibe so that you can finish the paper. It's like you have a sense of a need for that feel. Um, and the very, and I guess I was also going to say, one of the reasons why I think the phenomenology of beauty is so curious, like the example between beauty coming first versus pleasure coming first and then beauty, is because if you could do a certain science of beauty, I love that phrase, Mr. Jockin, a certain science of the phenomenology of beauty, maybe if you tracked that, you could get better at telling the difference between, say, the wisdom commons and the wisdom cults and maybe the wisdom circumscription or whatever terms we want to use, right? Because you could tell exactly what you said, Mr. Fishman, beauty is very dangerous. Beauty is precisely what lures you into the Venus fry trap, right? And definitely you see in Nazi Germany, the creation of the aesthetics and the, the pantry tree, like that was all creating the um, not so good vibe. All right, but they use the beauty for that, right? Well, how can you make sure that when you, when you say this is beautiful, it's not Nazi Germany, right? That's kind of the question. Well, maybe phenomenology is part of that, right? Maybe you're not just calling beautiful your uh, self-effacement drive, as I like to say, your death drive, right? How do you make sure that you're not just defining something self-destructive and beautiful, right? Well, maybe following the phenomenology is part of it. Maybe following where it comes from. And indeed, it does seem as if the best form of beauty is this first apprehend, move into the place of the good and the true. And that's why, like we were saying earlier, right? So then the question would become, can one get better at identifying when beauty appeared? What was the order of the beauty? Can we have the sort of faculties that have a higher sensitivity to that so that we might not fall into some of these problematic dynamics? And maybe that is somehow training that very faculty that we have that seems so mysterious to sense when we need to go downtown to work at the paper because the energy is not in the office, right? Maybe it's that faculty that also would be the one that says, hey, you need to leave this place because it's a cult. Hey, you shouldn't go there because it's self-serving. You sense the vibe. You sense that this is not actually going in the right direction. It is now becoming auto-cannibalistic. I'm so glad I got that word again. Word in again. I was worried. Um, and maybe all of this, as the final point, you brought up Adam and Eve, the garden and different things. Um, as I understand in demiology or you know study of angels or whatever, um, I don't know if there's a, there actually is a word for that, and it escapes me at this moment. Um, angels can apprehend totally. Like they can just apprehend. Like we have to think through and understand. Like an angel can look at something and get it totally right? They just apprehend the whole language or they apprehend it all. So apprehension and full understanding go together. But in a fallen state, to get the full apprehension, you have to work through the process. But isn't it interesting that almost as if it's that quote unquote angelic faculty in beauty, you do apprehend the whole. You do, you, when you, when you say I need to leave the office and work downtown, you actually do fully apprehend it. You don't have to sit around and go, how do I know I need to leave the office and go work downtown? You don't have to write out a paper with your argument and prove it. You just apprehend it and it's right and it's correct. And maybe that's why that has to lead. 
that faculty of a full apprehension has to leave because when we're ever taught, when we're, whenever we're talking about the true, the good, and the beautiful, we are always talking about a whole that we can never render entirely into parts. So the best we can do is an apprehension of a whole that we apprehend. And then if we ask how we apprehend it, it's gone. But we do know that if we go downtown, the vibe is better. So I hope everyone has a chance this evening to go downtown and to work on your platonic memes for Mr. Jockin's class, which will be coming up soon. Sam, really good to see you. Mr. Fishman, Mr. Jockin, Mr. Flores, thank y'all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.